Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast. We have our main card tonight. In the red corner, we have Vince Cachero, the anomaly, a bantamweight fighter for the UFC, born in Hawaii and fighting out of Los Angeles, California. And in the blue corner, we have Thomas Henley, a heavyweight ex Taekwondo fighter with a number of decorated medals. Fighting out of Harrogate in Yorkshire. Today, the 40 Orty podcast is bringing you this main card event. What is it like to be an autistic fighter? Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Love it, man. That was, uh, that was legit. They should, uh, they should look to get you in the cage soon out there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the 40 Orty podcast with, of course... Our guest today, Vince Cachero. How are you doing today? Good, good, Thomas. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. You said that you've you recently gone through sort of a big sort of move at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I spent the last year in uh, Texas, down in Houston, and now uh, I just moved up here to Wisconsin, and I'm going to be here for for three years uh, with my wife. She has a residency up here, and. Once she's done with that, we're moving straight back home to Hawaii. It's been a really long time, and I can't wait to get back. Yeah, because you're you're originally from from Hawaii. Were you are you a big surfer, or is that just like a really bad stereotype that I'm propagating? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a bad stereotype, but it is one of those things where not not everyone from Hawaii surfs all the time. So you know, I used to go <laughs> bodyboarding and stuff. And- <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. But uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I, I played soccer twenty four seven. And there was really no time for anything else. So that's it. that's me in a nutshell. I was always kind of involved in sports, and that's what let me just kind of get absorbed with life. So I guess you know, because what we're on today to kind of um, a sort of a chat about our experiences as autistic fighters, which I think is not something that I've ever come across on the internet. So it's probably a first for the world. <laughs> um, do you like to? sort of talk us for a little bit about your UFC career. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I started fighting, actually. Um, my first amateur fight was in 2013. I kind of just just fell into it. Um, you know, after, after school, after college, I knew I didn't want to go directly into finance, get that desk job that, uh, you know, I was kind of dreading for, for a while. I, I knew that just wasn't the lifestyle for me. And, you know, somehow found fighting. Uh, I, I took a crazy interest in it. And, you know, within months, I was knowing all the all the fighters, their records, this and that, like, it was just a complete deep dive. I ended up working at an MMA gym. And I saw some of my friends, uh, you know, fighting in these amateur shows. So I would go mm. watch them fight. And, and then I was like, well, I've been training and, and I'm watching these guys out there. I think I could beat some of these guys up. So you know, I hopped in, I lost my first fight. I was like, no, I just, the competitor in me wouldn't let that go. And, you know, I won 10 straight from there, uh, turn nice. pro. And again, it was a, a thing for me. Like I just wanted to turn pro just to say I did from when I was a kid, I want to be a professional soccer player. So I was like, okay, well I can check off that professional athlete box and, and then move on with my life. And, you know, as soon as I got that first professional fight, that first win, then it was no, nah, let's let's make it to the UFC. <laughs> so in yeah. three years, uh, I made it to the UFC. And for for those of you or those of the listeners who aren't too familiar with MMA, it's it's like the top show, right? It's the the top of the top. And luckily enough, I, I got in. Um, I was lucky to have great coaches around me, great teammates supporting me. Um, I fought the best opponents I could. I made it in on short notice fight. I fought up a weight class. Um, and I ended up losing, losing that match. It was on two days notice. It was during COVID. So oh the whole gosh. time it was like, you couldn't really train at gyms, but you kind of could. And it was kind of like, uh, my manager told me just maintain my weight. And it was like this extended period of time where months where I was trying to keep my weight low ish 
it was a, it was a really weird circumstance, but you know, I got in and I fought a really tough guy in Jamal Emmers. I put up a great fight, cracked him with some good shots, but um, you know, didn't go the way I hoped it would. And unfortunately I only had one more fight in the UFC. Um, I lost to a young up and comer and yeah, since that I, I got caught in, and that was really it. But fighting consumed my life for, geez, what was that? 10 years or so, 10, 11 years. Yeah. I um I like how at the the start of sort of telling you you just kind of you said that you just kind of fell into you know full contact combat sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just casually falling in, right? Yeah, just falling into <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> but that's amazing. Like just the fact that you you got into the UFC is just it's like a massive achievement. Like amazing achievement. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, per- personally, I, I've always been like, I've, been, I've always been like really into martial arts and, you know, I watch watch a lot of boxing, watch a lot of UFC. I don't tend to remember people's names. It's more like to watch how they sort of, you know, fight together and stuff. But most most of the stuff that I've been doing is like more on, along the lines of like striking. Um, I did a bit of Muay Thai, did a bit of boxing, did a lot of Taekwondo which is where it's sort of kickstarted things. But Yeah, I know you competed in that, right? Yeah, yeah. I I, I got pretty good um, at one point. Uh, sort of national champ, Commonwealth champ. Fought for the GB at a couple of events. But I, I just got really frustrated with it because it's a, it's a point-scoring martial art. So it's like you can really sort of give a beating to somebody, but if they just land their foot in the right place at the right amount of pressure then they did they can just outpoint you and it's just ridiculous um yeah so I, yeah I that seems strange to me as as someone where it really is just win or lose tap or the decision and whatnot and that's that's kind of why i was really attracted to to mma and being in the cage because at least for me it made more sense like okay if we're fighting then we're at least allowed to like fight you know and, and the fight's gonna go wherever it goes so i could see how that'd be pretty frustrating <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it is what I signed up for, but it was kind of like uh, at the tail end of when I sort of finished like pro- properly training and like getting into it, it was kind of kind of the point where I just got so sort of frustrated at the system and I was just like, ah, Taekwondo is probably not the best for me at the moment. I have sort of like, it was, I think I stopped when I was about 19. So it has been like a good five or six years since I was training properly. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe there might be, you know, my sort of calm down temperament may suit that a bit better. But I, th- I think the one thing that stops me from going into to MMA is, is like I'd be more likely to try something like kickboxing or um, uh, Muay Thai or stuff like that because I don't like the thought of someone on top of me trying to knock me out and punch my face in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's also, it's it's a little different with that. <laughs> and I, and I also I don't know if I'd be able to do it to someone else, but because of because of how striking dominant I am, it'd probably be the case. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. I don't know. It's it's kind of it's kind of a but like a little bit of a cliff edge that I'm not sure if I should jump into or not. It's yeah, like, <laughs> and I think it's important to realize too with most MMA training um, with with popular gyms and stuff out there because I used to work at gyms as well is that it's not a sport where you're going into the gym and you're going in to beat other people up. So yeah. like traditional martial arts, you have um, just a bunch of different things you could be doing. Like you mentioned Muay Thai, um, like Dutch style kickboxing. You've got boxing, which is just the hands. Um, you've got Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is ground grappling with submissions and then wrestling and all of that. So you can go in and, and be getting work. And most of these schools, you're not going to train to try to fight someone unless you're trying to turn into an amateur or a professional fighter. And, you know, a lot of people aren't necessarily trying to do that. So it is important to realize, I think, for people out there that, um, you know, if you're a fan of MMA and, and you want to see what it's like to, to do it, um, it doesn't mean that you're going to go into the gym and the next day you're actually fighting someone. Like it takes a little <laughs> while to, to learn technique, build up the confidence and, and spar if you choose to spar and things like that. So it is a thing where, where I suggest people to, to kind of try if they are interested in it. Um, don't think of it as just this 
brutality. Think of it as like, no, this is martial arts um, in a controlled form and fashion. It's just what you see on TV is literally just the fighting aspect. It's not the training, the preparation, the drilling aspects of it. Because the, the actual fight is such a tiny portion of all the work that you do, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's yeah. ultimately the thing that gives you the, the decision, but everything else, like the the nutrition and the sleep and the training and so the day to day and trying to keep on track and you know avoid all all the sort of lovely things that life has to offer, but perhaps isn't so healthy. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's there's a whole lot that goes into to being a fighter and living that fighter lifestyle that um, you know most people just just don't realize. Like I, you mentioned, things like the diet, things like that. I was what, that was one of the biggest, I guess, reliefs after I, I chose to retire was. Hey, I can, I can like go out and have a meal now. <laughs> My wife would ask me on a, on a Wednesday night, like, yo, you want to go out to dinner? And before it'd be like, no, like, nah, I'm watching my weight, keeping my weight low, eating healthy meals at home. But once that happened, it was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I guess I can go out and just eat food when I want to now. So that, <laughs> that was a relief, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of mental pressure that, that goes on with fighting. That's you know, at least for the time when I was in it, it was fun and engaging, but it, it takes its toll. And the the weight cutting, that's yeah, uh, quite a big part of it as well. Like, um, I remember at my at my lowest weight, I'm it's the same height as I was now. I'm about six three now. I weigh about 110 kilos, and um, when I was fighting, I got down to about 72 kilos at the same height. Oof, yeah, obviously, obviously, I've I've been to the gym the past couple of years, but like. I, I, look, I didn't look like a professional fighter. I look like I've just come out of a prison camp. <laughs> like, this is how, like, just yeah. how bloody ripped I was. But, like, the, the categories and stuff, they're so harsh. And, like, in Taekwondo, because it's all about kicking, like, your leg length is such a massive factor. Because, you know, in, in boxing and stuff, if, if you sort of get clipped a little bit by... You know, someone's someone's kick, it doesn't really matter. But if you get clipped by someone's kick in Taekwondo, it could sort of give them a point. And mm-hmm. um, so we always just push, go go lower, lower, low as you can, low as you can. And it was, um, so it's weird the headspace that you get in when you're kind of cutting and stuff, because you know that you can't eat. So you just like sort of in this hyper focus mode, but there's no food to, to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. People don't see, see that th- side of thing. And, and it's very much the same in MMA where because you are competing and there are weight classes, you know, your coaches and everyone around you, they're always trying to push you to go lower. So you can have, <laughs> you know, the size advantage, the reach advantage, strength, all that good stuff. But it does reach that kind of tipping point where you're just depleting yourself so much that it's not beneficial anymore. No, um, sure. And it's, uh, it, it is interesting, like you said, with, with making those drastic cuts, because at least now I feel as more information gets out there, um, in MMA, it used to be just brutal. You know, you throw on that, that trash bag, that sweatsuit <laughs> yeah. and just run just like Spit the traditional wrestlers do. Exactly. You used to put and, and, go man and like... <laughs> As we oh, as we man. were making laps around, we'd spit in the bin and like. <laughs> yep, exactly. So you you know how it goes, and and it's it's brutal to do it that way. At least now, um, in the UFC and stuff, they have nutritionists and and these general guidelines that they're trying to coach us through and teach us so that we aren't just doing it that way. We're doing it a little bit more scientific, and we're rehydrating properly, things like that. But um, it it's still bad because you're still crushing your body. Like, uh, just to give people an example. I'm like one of the lighter guys who fights at 135, so 135 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I usually walk around, um, I'd be 153 or so before the fight, 151, maybe 149. And, you know, within a matter of a few days, you're cutting down all the way to 135 pounds. And, you know, you're taking out all that water, all of the the food, the carbs that are holding on to water in your body. Like you're going through (laughs) the whole process to make sure you can get out whatever water you can. And then you put it right back on the next day. You're right back up to 152, 153. Now and I'm like fight. one of the smaller. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you'll fight someone. So it's you, you add both those things together. There's a lot of uh, mental stress and, and literally physical stress in your body, but um, you know, it's part of the game. It's part of the challenge. And it, um, at least for me, it was, it was an interesting, fun part of the journey for sure. 
it's definitely a, a whole a whole experience, isn't it? It kind of absorbs every single part of your life when you're <laughs> when you're fighting. Everything's yeah, uh, gotta be con in control. Like so we've talked a lot about sort of MMA and me just just asking you loads of questions about, mm -hmm. about what it's like to be a fighter. But mm -hmm. um you know, the other part of our um chat is talk a bit about autism as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess the the best place to start off with is when and how did you get diagnosed? Yeah, so my diagnosis was actually pretty recent, maybe just like two, three months ago. Um, oh, so wow. This happened, yeah, this happened actually after I was fighting. Uh, there's another fighter I've been in contact who was also in the UFC. Um, uh, his name is John Doomsday Howard. People can look him up. And he underwent kind of the same process. He fought in the UFC. He's out and he's actually still fighting. He's an, he's an OG. He's been fighting forever. Um, mm -hmm. But through some examinations and stuff, um, th he figured out that he was autistic as well and he got diagnosed. So it was interesting. I reached out to him because I'm like, yo, what's going on? Like, like this is this is what a psychiatrist just told me. And so we've been going back and forth. But yeah, basically you asked what my story with it was, is, um, you know, I've been out of fighting. Uh, I got cut from the UFC last year and I decided it was, it was time to move on with my life, take that next step and, and sure. take on whatever I need mm -hmm. to. Um, but it, it was a really tough year for me. Um, like a really tough year mentally gain over the identity of how I associated with fighting, um, who I, I thought I was like, I got so lost into this persona, this identity of being a fighter that without it, like I knew I needed to move on from it. But at the same time, like I was just like hurting myself so much on the inside. And, um, you know, I went through a really, really bad depressive phase that was, oh, geez, probably like six months long where it was it was bad, bad. So mm. I knew I had issues and, and I've faced depression all of my adult life um, and going through bouts of that, uh, of being okay. And then being depressed, being okay. And, and, you know, I was fighting and I was winning fights. So it always just got me through, but this time I knew something needed to change. Um, mm. So my wife and my family, they were telling me basically not even, not giving me an ultimatum, but they're like, you need to see a therapist. Like you have to see a therapist. And I think that this is a, a big problem with, with fighters, especially, but maybe just men in general is that we feel like we're too quote unquote weak if we, mm. if we need to see a therapist. So yeah. it was this weird feeling as I was fighting, like, yo, I know I have these issues. I know I'm super depressed, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to keep doing what I do because if I'm depressed enough and weak enough to go get help, then that means that I can't be a world champion. And I know that this line of thinking is not logical at all, but you know, as a fighter who's kind of obsessed with what they're doing and mm -hmm. they're putting everything into trying to win, it's, uh, it's just this unhealthy mechanism where you're like, Oh, this is the truth. Like I can't get help. Like I'm not going to be a champ if I get help. Like, let me just do my thing. So Going back to, to where we were last year, it was finally, okay, well, I'm not fighting anymore. These people are begging me to get help. So I finally started getting help. Um, I started seeing a therapist and, you know, it was, it was weird, you know, for the first few months, it, um, it was difficult. I felt like I wasn't really connecting with them that much. And then a lot of things started to turn and I started uh, feeling a lot more like myself, whatever that means and um, feeling better. And, you know, long story short, some things happened. I, I I started feeling better and better, feeling more comfortable in myself. Started expressing myself more. Yeah. Um, I went to Vegas with with some of my boys. Just this trip that happened to work out together because my dad was out there. And it, this is gonna sound so strange, but I was in this really receptive state of mind on the flight home, and I was watching the movie um, The Big Short. And I don't Big know if, if yeah, I don't know if you've watched that. It's about like the housing collapse in two thousand and eight. It's a it's a fantastic movie, but Christian Bale, who's a great actor, he was mm. um, portraying Dr. Michael Burry, and Dr. Michael Burry is someone who is um, diagnosed with Asperger's in real life, and he was at least how Christian Bale is acting in the movie. I was like, wait a second, I'm kind of resonating with a lot of the tendencies he's doing with, you know, having the headphones on, blasting the loud music while he's intensely focusing of just his mannerisms of, of not making the eye contact and being really quirky 
um, mm-hmm. with the people around him and things. And, you know, that's just surface level stuff. But for whatever reason in, in that state, I was like, wait, like that's kind of how it's been for me my whole life. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as we do, it kind of just sent me down this rabbit hole of looking at the research and finding out that it's, it's often passed from fathers to sons. And that's how he found out that it happened. And I look at my father, I'm like, okay, I see it's a lot of tendencies here. My dad's very artistic. He's, he's an amazing painter, but you know, I just, I see a lot of tendencies. And so, I am yeah, I started with that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So that, that whole thing happened. Um, and basically I started expressing myself more through Instagram stories, which is, you know, weird, but for me, it's, it's, it's hard for me to express feelings with words. And even though I'm like mm-hmm. talking right now, I, I, it's just real hard for me and it always has been. And so I felt, I I've always found tools like, um, photography, videography. I just, I picked those traits up or those uh, skills up because it allowed me to, express myself more and so with with instagram stories it's like okay cool i can slap on music that means something to me visuals that mean something to me i can put in words that mean something and hopefully this portrays like my feelings and thoughts so i just started letting letting it go because i'm like okay i think i might have this like i already scheduled something with my therapist we're gonna go down this route of trying to see if this is what i got and like you are making a, a lot of headway like yeah just <laughs> yeah like, trying honestly to. honestly man like I, I, f- I found it really interesting as well, like, because you were saying about, um, you know, f- throughout your career, you've sort of on and off depressed, on and off kind of mm-hmm. thing. And, you know, my part of my diagnosis is that I have quite quite severe depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. So, like, I just I just find it, I don't know if it's, is it a coincidence? Is it like a, I don't know, did you, did you have a tough time in school? And it kind of like transferred or is it just kind of like a yeah. not really feeling at one with other fighters or the community or like, uh, yes, a lot of that. So basically when I was doing my whole thing, um, a lot of my friends and people around me thought I was having like a full on mental breakdown. And I admit like I was kind of all over the place, but I ended up going to um, the hospital to, to visit a psychiatrist and mm-hmm. we started talking about all this. They sent me, they thought I was okay and cleared to go, sent me to another psychiatrist to get evaluated. And he was the one who told me, he's like, yeah, like, yeah, you, you're like checking off everything for autism. I think that this is, this is what's going on. And so it, it started to click then. Right. And so when mm-hmm. I look back, back to your question of how you're asking me how I, I felt through all this, it was, it was really strong with school. And anytime there's these new social situations, that's this this massive anxiety and this ability to feel disconnected and wanting to connect so bad for me mm-hmm. that I would, I don't know, just, just go through it mentally to, to try to fit in. Um, I always felt ever since I was a little kid um, that I was just, just different. I don't know if you've seen, have you seen the movie men in black with yeah, uh, Will you, Smith? You just kind of, you kind of feel like you just, you just out of tune a little bit with the world you just like that I, yeah. I don't really understand that like people tell you stuff that they they think that you're gonna agree with wholeheartedly and understand and you're just like could you explain that to me like <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah know? it's it's kind of like not this not understanding social context and situations and on top of that feeling literally like you see this online a lot or at least i have so far of, of people feeling like aliens and when i was a little mm-hmm. kid i watched the movie men in black and there's this one human and his face comes up and there's a little alien sitting inside. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, yo, that's me. Like, that's absolutely <laughs> me. I, I've had this vision many times before that there's this, like these people inside behind me that are running the show. And like, I don't really know what's going on out here and stuff. And it, yeah, I mean, my whole life has been kind of that and struggling to understand these social situations. Um, you know, the whole eye contact thing is a big issue for me, but I also learned how to kind of mask these traits in a way mm. that when you, when you like fighting and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. With, um, I mean, I think for me, fighting was a way to kind of release all the, the, the pain inside and the anger inside and just the frustration inside of trying to fit in and 
feeling so different and feeling so wrong in a way. And I know now that, you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to feel those ways. Like I was really just like, I have a weird, I have a different lens, you know, like being autistic, being on the spectrum, you're, you're just kind of hardwired a little bit differently and it starts to make sense. But at the time it's like, yo, why am I not like these other people? Why is it so hard for me to fit in? Why am I always trying to fit in? And for me, when I'm fighting and, and when I'm training and things, it, it really just forces you to be completely present and in the zone. And for me, that's just a way to let go of, of my brain and all the thinking and just be in the moment. And then also kind of release all that tension that is constantly building up inside of me. Especially when you're doing like a really sort of power, power heavy pad session or something like. Exactly. You just, like, you just keep going and you're just trying to work through it. And it just feels so good after you like. It's like, oh, that person who looked at me weird. <laughs> oh, this, yeah. this social situation where I didn't feel like I could speak up because I didn't know when people were stopping talking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, it's so all there, man. Like it's all like, <laughs> yeah, and, and things that I'm not sure how to really explain this, but until I found about all this, that I didn't really know how to handle these situations. Like, because I move every, I noticed when I look back at my life, I've noticed every time I've moved, switched jobs, lost a job, whatever it is, like just massive shutdowns. Like I would start to get depressed right away and it would be heavy. Those and transitions. Just, yeah. Like. The lack of routine, the lack of knowing, like having your, your stable set of, of what's going on. And even just this move up to Wisconsin, it's so recent. We just moved here uh, two weeks ago. You know, we had the move. Our families helped us. My wife has some family up here. So we met like two sets of cousins multiple times, all these new social situations where there's like a bunch of people around. And this was the first time in my life where I kind of felt this feeling building up inside of me. Like, yo, this is like, I'm getting too anxious. I I couldn't really identify what it was. And I felt something happening, like a meltdown coming on. And it sure enough, it, it did come on. I ended up like crying on the couch. We're talking about everything, things like that. But for me, I was happy to, to for once kind of notice it building up. And mm. so I it's think kind of like, you know, when people, people are epileptic, they sort of, they like talk about, they know when it's going to come on because they get this like aura feeling, like they feel mm. it just, they feel just this third sense that they're going to have one. And there is, there is actually one for a meltdown. I've, I've, well, for me, I found like, if I have this, it's kind of like this weird sort of release of pressure and then dissociation. And then I'm like, yes, I'm going to have a meltdown. I should probably, mm. probably leave. But it's, it's confusing, isn't it? Cause it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's bad. Like it yeah. could be all of the family and stuff that you really like. And they're all <laughs> together for the first time. All of these people that you like and mix together and like finding ways to interact with each person and interact with them as a group it's just just very like overwhelming i guess yeah yeah absolutely super overwhelming and i think that uh, you know i encountered that not with just family but but team so as you know you have your martial arts teams and in mma mm-hmm. some people tend to to jump around in different camps or because we have all these martial arts you know i have to get my wrestling from here my boxing from here my sparring there um it always took me a really long time to start to fit in with new teams Sure. And, and again, like this could be something that's just going on in my head, but whether it's going on in my head or everyone else can feel it or sense it, like it's, it's going on inside of me. And I felt that big time, um, every single time that, that I transferred teams or started training with a new team. And it was, it was taking its toll on me. And I realized too, like for the last team, when I, I got to the UFC, my wife, um, she, she got a internship in a different state. So I had to move mm. state. I had to leave my teams that I was with for a long time and have this new team. And it, it was a great team, great coaches, I loved all the guys there, but it was so hard for me socially to get along, to try to fit in, to feel normal. And I, again, like I was facing just this depressive episode because it was just a lot of tension and anxiety for me. Um, so although you're not, you're not like you're not like going at each other like you would in like a an actual fight, an actual ring, but you are making contact with people and, you know, greasing people and, you you know, you're 
either hitting them or they're mm-hmm. grappling you or something like. And if you don't know someone, it makes it feel a lot less. It it felt feels a lot less hard for me to spar with someone that I don't know than yeah. someone that I do know. Because I'm like, all right, okay, I know how much how hard they hit, how fast they are, how small they're big they are and um i can sort of adjust my game to fit their level but when when you when you come across someone that you don't know it's like you hit them a bit too hard and you you don't know whether you should go sorry or like you know i don't want to hit that hard i just i just don't know how good you are <laughs> like <laughs> yeah you have all those weird dynamics when when sparring new people <laughs> joining new teams and that and that comes with with everyone that switches around. And, and for me, it was, it was that aspect, but I would say even more so just the camaraderie before and after training. Like when we're mm. in the zone and we're training, I'm usually just good to go, but it's the, Oh, we're stretching and talking. And like, how do I enter this conversation? Like, who should I go talk to? Like, who do I stand by? Like, who are the cool guys? Who are the weird guys? Who are the, these guys? And and these are all things that like just mentally have always been a struggle for me. And it's not to say that that I should be ranking anyone in this weird social hierarchy, but it's just just things that I've struggled with. And it just puts so much anxiety and pressure on on me and, and myself that I didn't, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize that everyone else didn't go through all these same thought processes and things like that. So those were the biggest, the hardest things for me was transitioning to new teams socially rather than fighting. Because mm-hmm. when it's when it's in the cage and when we are sparring and training, it's like, oh, it's my skill versus yours. It's it's I I understand what's going on, but when it's me trying to like talk to these new guys that I don't know, that's like all oh, like kills me on the inside. I I I get what you mean about like the fight. Like there's so many rules and there's so many sort of like you you wake up and you know exactly what you need to do in this situation. You need to mm-hmm. to defend yourself. You need to try and knock them out. You need to try and score points, whatever. And like in real life. If someone was to come up to me and start a fight, like, or speak to me, you know, aggressively or, you know, I don't really know at what point I'm okay to beat them up or, but like, I find, I find that, found that really, really hard in secondary school. Like I knew that I was good at fighting, um, but it only, it took like, you know, a few people who were just kind of testing the, the boundaries to, you know, at what point do I actually fight and do i hit hit them as hard as i can or like there's so many questions about what the social implications of me attacking someone is you know no matter if it's you know like for one person it might be oh just run away or for another person might be yeah give them a fight you know because they'll stop doing it or the other Mm -hmm. person might say oh yeah just just knock them about a little bit yeah but don't hurt them too much because then the the teachers will be frustration so much, uh, so much to compute compute going on there uh, you know uh, one funny fact about myself is i've actually never even been in a street fight i've only fought <laughs> uh, in the cage professionally and stuff so it's it's a uh, a lot of like people from when i was younger and classmates and things when they hear that i end up fighting and fighting the ufc and stuff it's like i didn't see that coming <laughs> but for me like you're saying there's a there's a lot of order and routine when you're actually in the training room and and that routine, I think, was kind of my saving grace because otherwise the world is just <laughs> so crazy. You know, you know what you have to do. Mm-hmm. Like, there's there's no sort of gray areas or anything. Like, you know what you can do in the cage. Mm-hmm. You know what you you your goal is. You know what the other person's goal is. There's none of that sort of social complexity that's surrounding it. It's like even even people on TV and the the audience and the crowd and stuff they're watching you to do that thing, so you're gonna do it. I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's just as soon as you step out of that sort of straightforwardness of just right, we're gonna fight together. Both of us want to do it into like uh, the real world. It's like, how do I how do I go about this? It's um, it's, pretty, it's one one of the things that I still really haven't manage to suss out exactly what what you should do you know yeah i'm with you on that one i'm with you on that one i have been looking a lot back at fighting and finding this order in it and it makes sense a lot more now that there was more routine in it than i thought 
Like I, I thought that, oh, I'm a fighter. Like I enjoy chaos, this and that, but it's really not the case. There's like this easily definable social hierarchy in fighting. You have your records, you know, who fought who you have your organizations, you know, that let's say the UFC is above uh, a different organization like the LFA, which is more of a feeder to the UFC, things like that. And so there was a lot more order that I could see through fighting and it made my life simpler. Cause it's like, okay, I go do this. I fight these people. I try to work my way up. Um, you know, I spar with these guys. I need to beat these top guys cause they beat this person. It, it all makes sense. Whereas when you're in this just social setting, it's like, I guess kind of confusing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. No, I, I get it completely. Get it, man. Um, I guess, you know, a really good question to ask is, you know, look, obviously you had your diagnosis post your UFC career, post fighting, stuff like that. Looking back, do you see any particular challenges or things that you found hard? Like for, for me, if, if, I get, if I just go first and sort of list the things that I found hard, it was mostly about the lighting. The lighting is very harsh and it's very bright. It's very white and it really set me off. The noises. Uh, the amount of people everywhere, um, especially when you're not in like a like a top like ranked event, it's absolute chaos. You don't know when you're going to fight at all. Um, you don't know who you're going to fight, where, what time. So you just kind of <laughs> have to like hang around in this this big sports venue all day and try and stay warm and try and like. I, I and I think I think also there's just a lot there's a lot of pressure when you fight, especially for for me in point point scoring. It feels it felt a lot more twitchy to to fight with somebody, um, and you know that puts a lot of pressure because it's like oh you let you let your guard slip at one angle and they catch you. And like oh I've had, I mean I've had meltdowns probably before about thirty percent of my fights. Mm. like just just before having a panic attack just before my fight i never stopped doing it i managed to compose myself and get in the ring and sometimes well most of the time i won but it was just kind of it's the whole the whole environment around it around the actual fight day was just absolutely horrific for me yeah um, yeah it's a lot if you have those types of sensory issues there's there's a lot of chaos going on on the day um, and especially as you said, it, I could imagine not knowing like the time, the order when you're going up, things like that would kind of wreck you. Cause at least with ours, there, there's a, like more of a structured time thing. And, and especially as you got to the higher shows, there's like, oh, you're going to go on and it's going to be right around this time, like this actual time. Sure. Yeah. And I remember in my first few amateur fights, it was a little bit less structured and it was kind of like, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. And there's just so much anxiety. Uh, that comes along with that, not knowing when you're going to fight, what the crowd's going to feel like, what all the noises are going to be. Um, you know, for me, after the first few fights, I, I, I managed and I was lucky enough to, to kind of get rid of some of those nerves. Uh, mm-hmm. Because again, for me, like I was so just intently focused on performing well and doing what I do best that a lot of it came easy. And oddly enough, like I didn't have like obviously everyone gets nervous, everyone gets really anxious. Um, I didn't have any crazy meltdowns before fights. It was really after fights. It was when mm. I lacked the structure. Like I don't, there's this date on the wall, right? Like this is when my fight day is. This is what I got to do. This is what weight I got to be at. And as soon as that day was gone, I would always kind of go through a little moody phase. And, and my wife noticed it as well, that anytime I didn't have a date, and a structure as to where I'm going to fight next, when I'm going to fight next, who I'm going to fight next. It, um, I struggled mentally because, you know, I, I didn't have any routine at that point. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what to expect. And, and then that's when I tend to get overloaded. Same, like we're talking so about a lot, these... lot about like, <clears throat> sorry, mm-hmm. a lot about the, the routine and stuff for you then, I suppose. But I guess, yeah. I guess like whenever I've watched, you the sea fights you do you do have like your own like sort of room where you can like train and you with people and it's like a controlled environment mm-hmm. like i can imagine that that's that's a lot nicer than because I, I i i suppose it's a consequence of um 
more money being in UFC than yeah Taekwondo, but um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I could imagine definitely. that would help a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you have your own like mini little locker rooms, things like that, yeah. um, and you have your coaches there. And if you have good coaches like I have um, for most of my career, especially one of my head coaches who's my longest head coach, Adam Lerner, he, you know, he he also oddly enough shows a lot of traits too. And I, I he kind of suspects the same thing. Um, but cool. we, we resonated really well with each other and we just, we always had a routine of what we do. So before a fight, we weren't doing anything new. We weren't training anything new. It was just like these coded words, this and that we're going to hit the pads this way. We're going to move around. We're going to get this type of work in and then we go out and fight. And so I think as a fighter and, and just as a human, you know, that sense of, of routine, provides you with like a comfortable feeling. So even though there is that anxiety of the actual fight coming on, um, having that for me was, was really comforting. Cause the, the world is tends to be a lot more sort of confusing for us. Cause we don't perhaps naturally understand the things that other people are just like fed in from the environment mm-hmm. into their body, into their minds. So like, from a very early age, we develop like a real sort of fixation on, right, this is how things are going to go. We're gonna, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have this particular food. I'm going to go to school. It's going to have this 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 structure for this day. I come home. I have my tea. I go, I go do some Taekwondo. I come back. I sleep. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, that, that helped a lot with, with me. And, um, I just want to keep it a bit on topics. We're talking a little bit about the challenges, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but, um, do you have any other, other sort of things that you can, you can remember or is it yeah, mostly I mean, about the routine? Honestly, it was, it was a lot of the routine. And, and like I said too, it was, it was more so the social challenges because people don't understand too with, with fighting and with MMA is that as much as I wish, and a lot of us fighters wish it was only about the fighting there's this whole like personal branding aspect that you have to do that it is sports entertainment at the end of the day. When you look at the uh, place like the UFC and things, you know, the Conor McGregor's of the world and stuff, this is how you're going <laughs> to make Patty your money. The body now. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Patty the Batty, you know, just got a nice win I, and, a, and a tea bag. You know, <laughs> you know what I think? I think I, I was working with a uh, organization called fighting for autism. Mm. And I seem to remember seeing his face. Seeing, seeing that picture of him. So I think he might have been doing something. He's been actually, really. yeah, he's been doing a lot with um, with mental health stuff and working with kids and things like that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised mm-hmm. if he is doing that. And, and he's obviously, because of things like that, I'm rooting for him. Um, I think that his, his entertainment style isn't as, I think it's more lighthearted than Connor, which is a good thing because <laughs> we all kind of saw where Connor went and who he turned himself into and, uh, is most definitely a bad guy now or the bad guy. I don't know if he's playing that role, but it's leaking into his regular life. And um, the heel, you know that, as they yes, the heel. Yeah. yeah, the heel. But then when the heel starts punching old guys at the bar, then it's like, yo, you got to get that under control, my man. <laughs> so um, it, it is a weird thing of you You see people like Connor and then we, we try to model that because it's like, well, I need to get my money too. Well, I have this mm. chance. Like it really is even Dana White said in the UFC, like this is an opportunity. This, this isn't a career. You can't be in fighting forever. Very few people get to to stick around for a long time. And even if you do, um, there's no guarantee that you're going to be around the fight industry afterwards. Mm. So it is kind of like this real, you know, flash in the pants type of thing, like, or flash in the dark. You're hopping in and you got to make your money where you can. So from a, an earlier stage, if you're paying attention It's like you kind of need to market yourself, brand yourself on social media, things like that. And I feel like for me, that caused a lot of internal struggles because now it's like, well, who am I? You're not just a fighter. You are a marketer Mm -hmm. and a fighter. Exactly. Exactly. And then it's, and then it's, I want to be true to myself, but you know, if you're someone like me, who's able to kind of mask around and, and camouflage into into situations, that's kind of just how I, I, I got about everything is then it becomes hard to like okay well what do i portray like who am i things like that and these more i guess existential questions were were arising and those were an issue for me through this fight career Uh, again it was like the fighting was the easy part for me the learning i love that like fighting is 
I'm all about it. But all the other things around it, especially the social things, those probably the politics, kind of, the politics, and yeah, because so, so sh- like having good social skills and like charisma, it gets you so many places in life. Mm-hmm. Like it's it can literally enhance every single aspect of your life to have good social skills and charisma. So we're 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 inherently at a pretty big disadvantage of the of the bat like Mm -hmm. you know whether it comes to talking to coaches or sort of sort of melding into the the training environment or getting opportunities or you know asking for a raise or you know all of those things yeah you have to be liked by the person you have to be like a figure and especially as a fighter like having charisma and having so that sort of calm confidence or sometimes loud confidence is quite mm-hmm. important for sort of like marketing yourself, isn't it? So I, I yeah. think I'd be awful. <laughs> I'd be awful at a press conference. I'd just be like, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in. The other guy's like, I'm going to walk in, bam, knock out, going to, you know, rough it up. I'd just be like, <laughs> are you sure? Like, I, don't, <laughs> I know that you're supposed to put this bravado on, but like, are you really sure that you're going to do that? And if not, like, I'm going to f*** you up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, like, I, I don't know, because I wouldn't be able to switch myself into the press conference mode. I just, I just mm-hmm. like, I'd just be a right clown, honestly. People <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you know what's funny? You know what? Something that did help me a lot with this um, is I'm a part of this this YouTube channel called Fight Tips that – um my yes, friend Shane Bazin started. I love, yeah. I love fight tips. Yeah, Shane's, you know, he's it's massive right now. It's it's at three million and it continues to grow. And he saw something in me, luckily enough, when we we're just sparring together in LA one time and he asked me how I did certain move and I explained it. And you know, he brought me on to, to teach some stuff. So, you know, I have some videos on there and I'm a part of the the online program they have. We have courses on there. But it was really interesting because obviously with that being a YouTuber, you know, as well, um, and, and myself being a videographer, but usually someone behind the camera, you have to learn how to like put on this persona to be in front of the camera. Yes. And the <laughs> first few times, you know, I was filming with him. It was, it was really hard for me. Like I prepared for hours, dude, like hours, like thinking of what I'm going to say, like rehearsing everything needing to do that. needing to, to put on the face like I'm doing right now, smiling and all that. Um, like usually I don't smile this much, but because I know like, you know, there's a podcast setting things like that. It, it mm-hmm. kind of just turns on now because I was filming and doing a lot of those videos with them. So it's not to say it's, it's a good or bad thing, but it's, it taught me like how to kind of put on a little bit more of that charisma. Um, and, and I think that that kind of helped me too, through like fight interviews and whatever other sure. podcasts, things like that. Um, it helped me kind of learn how to mold myself to the situation more. So for me, I, I've always been good at kind of recognizing patterns and, and trying to understand them and being really curious about them. So that, that kind of helped me like deal with a lot of stuff as I was getting older and it allowed me to kind of camouflage and blend in with people. But at the same time, like, as you know, it's effort, right? I suppose that kind of brings us sort of into the advantages. Cause like, mm-hmm. pro- I suppose problem, problem solving is one of the, problem solving ability is one of the uh, things that I love that's quite highly linked to autism like being able to kind of approach it from different angles more logically without the cloud clouded emotion you know I think one, one of the things that I f- that I found really beneficial to me as an autistic fighter was um, my pain tolerance mm-hmm. so I I have a really I have a really low tolerance for sharp pain, like needles, scratches, things like that. They they hurt. They hurt so much. <laughs> but when it comes to blunt pain, I am I can I can take it all day. And um you know, especially especially in Taekwondo, I remember this 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 one fight. Uh, I think it was one of the first sort of ranked fights that I went into and I was a junior at that point. I was about 78 kilos. And um they put me up. They put me up at this this event. I think it was like somewhere in like Germany or Holland or something like that. And um, first match, I was against a uh, top one seeded for my category, and he gave me the absolute 
biggest, like I walked onto it and everything, the biggest back kick I've ever received in my life. Like literally it's one of those where it kind of like, <gasps> like it yeah. literally just like, <laughs> and then just dropped on the ground. I'm like, fuck. Like, I, but I, I managed to get off. Like after a second, I'm just like, what the hell happened? I got up and I started fighting again. But I feel like there'll be a lot of circumstances like that, especially like, um, you know, you, you kick their elbow a, a few too many times or you clash legs or I feel like m- most people would struggle with that pain. But for me, it was mm-hmm. kind of like I can could sort of brush it off a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely resonate with that too. Um, and I would say probably, you know, a lot of a lot of us, like they can, for some reason, you just you just tolerate it and it, it is kind of, I guess you're, you're in the moment, it could be adrenaline, it could be this or that, or it could be just that you have this this higher pain tolerance, um, both physically, obviously, with, with the fighting, um, and then emotionally too. I feel like they both kind of go hand in hand, at least for me, because if I'm suffering through whatever I am mentally or, or just going through that, I was always able to just like, uh, well, kind of push it aside and then onto the next fight or, or just keep going and keep showing up the training, keep doing this and that. And, you know, I don't know, it's probably not healthy to do that, obviously. Um, but I think that for me, you know, I resonate with that, the ability to just kind of take on that pain and just, just keep going. Mm-hmm. Stoic, yeah. the stoic sort of, yeah, one of those those fighters that just kind of keep out of distance a bit, but keep on closing in, and mm-hmm. that kind of that kind of mentality. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I was a pressure so fighter. I love doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, for me, I was I was just absolutely mad. Like I, I like you were saying about fights being like an outlet for mental health. Mm-hmm. That was that was me. I was lit- yeah. I would literally just start off because it's. We had about, well, when I started, it was about one and a half minutes and then a minute break and then one and a half minutes, a minute break, one and a half minutes. So like the action has to be like really high from the get go. And, um, I did like loads of anaerobic training, loads of running, loads of stuff. So I could just keep up kicking like throughout the entire three rounds. Um, didn't always work. Like if I had a difficult opponent, then they'd gas me out and then take a few points at me and win at the end. But most of the time it worked. And I think my ability to kind of train so, so much with weights and so much with like anaerobic training was a lot to do with my pain tolerance. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like even now, like going to the gym, like I can, I could do 20 sets every every single set being a drop set and i i i would enjoy that um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah is... you're a madman that it sticks with you whatever your sport you're doing whether it's taekwondo <laughs> whether it's lifting weights like you're just gonna kind of push yourself into these weird spots and yeah no that that makes sense to me <laughs> you got a screw loose um also <laughs> also with the, the the eye contact as well um i didn't like i don't like making eye contact with people that I'm fighting. Um, I make a little bit like when we're sort of stood at the side of the, you know, as for you, it'd be kind of standing at the side of the cage, waiting for the referee to say go. Uh, for me, it would be kind of sat on the chair, getting my getting my gear all strapped on and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was in the actual fight, I don't move my eyes. I just keep my, my eyes locked on like the upper torso. So like... Most people, they'd sort of be looking up and down where they're going to kick. But for me, I never moved my vision. So they couldn't sort of look at my eyes to see where I'm going to kick. Um, yeah. Which helps a lot because I love that. I can't remember what it's called. Um, where you go where you go for a turning kick, you go for a just a normal, normal kick and then you flip it up and knock the red off. Yeah, like a little question mark or yeah, that extra. Question, so you're throwing like mark. towards the body and then going to the head. Yeah, yeah I, did <laughs> I did a lot of those. I did a lot of those. A lot, a lot of stabs with side kicks, a lot of back kicks, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I, f- I feel like the eye contact thing really helped me in that sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Good... <laughs> it's a benefit there. Did you guys? I gotta ask. Did you guys play the whole eye contact match before the match actually started? Have you kind of heard of of that thing before? 
no, I know it. I know what you mean. Um, but I, I, I did like when we were sort of like around in the venue and stuff, if I knew I was going to fight, I mean, I usually go one of two ways. If they're an arsehole, then I will do that. And I'll just stare yeah. them down and sort of smile at them while I'm staring at them and talking to them. <laughs> it sounds really, <laughs> sounds really bloody crazy in any other context, but, um, yeah. but if they're nice, then I'll kind of just like just chat to them like a mate. And then as soon as fight, fight time is on, I just, I probably push harder than usual because they kind of expect you to be a bit more reserved because you're all friendly and stuff. But uh-huh. yeah, um, yeah. The, my first few uh, amateur fights, that was like the big thing was playing this eye contact match. So as soon as you step into the ring or they step <laughs> in, whoever goes in first, you're like staring at the other person and you, it's whoever breaks first loses, whoever breaks the eye contact first loses. So it was just, it was dumb. Like I did it for maybe two or three <laughs> fights max. I was like, oh, what am I doing? Like, I'm just adding more anxiety to this. Like, I, I don't need that right now. This proves nothing to me, and especially as someone who, who normally doesn't like to make eye contact naturally anyways. Like for me, it was just, it was too much anxiety, but yeah, I just, like I think back on like, that. It's so foolish. <laughs> you see videos of like Mike Tyson, like before mm-hmm. his matches, he's like, you know, he's like proper just, he got really anxious before his fights as well, mm-hmm. um, actually. But um, he had this, he did that kind of stare thing, but he just did it so well. He just kept locking on and he had all of this, like all of these knockouts behind him. And so it was just like this crazy sort of aura that he gave off. But I don't think, I, I don't think that's me. I don't think I could, I, I'm more likely to be nice and friendly and then, then fight. Um. <laughs> yeah yeah i was i was more of the same way i never really had that kind of attitude it was weird though because as you're saying how you're more of like an aggressive fighter so i was i was a very aggressive fighter most of my fights were all you know basically keeping the fight on the feet pressuring and, yeah. and dominating yeah. on the feet um and i was just a heavy pressure fighter like that and so for me too like i stopped needing the eye contact thing to act tough or anything because i knew like I'm going to make this fight kind of violent. This is the way I fight. Like it's going to be a scrap. I don't need to like try to prove myself before it starts. So sure. it, was, uh, is a good point. it was just a fun phase to, to go through that though. Cause I look back and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You're just a dumb little kid trying this out. <laughs> you literally, literally all of your attention is going on trying to lock eye contact. Yeah. And then, like, <laughs> the, the bell goes and you're like, Oh fuck. Like what's my opening? <laughs> oh, <God>. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh man. Oh, well, it's oh, honestly really, really great to hear. Have any other advantages that you feel like um, the good old neurodiversity has bring, brought you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, for me, I, I've always seen patterns in a lot of stuff, like visually, yeah, mentally. Like I just, I, lo- I love connecting the dots. Um, and I think with fighting, especially MMA, you have all these different arts, right? Um, you start to realize the patterns of movement, the sequences of movement, how they translate into each other um, and then how that creates an advantage for you. So at least for me, I always picked up new moves, new techniques pretty quickly, especially when you have a a sport, let's say jujitsu or something like that, where, you know, most of the the schools and teachings is the same way. Like you come, you warm up, you go over the certain techniques for the day, you do your drills and then you start rolling or you start sparring with each other. And I would notice that a lot of my friends like are just not, picking up the new movements quickly. And for me, I would Mm. like download them almost instantly. I wouldn't be able to use them all the time. And especially my fighting style, like I just molded it to my fighting style, but I did know that I I was really good at learning new things, um, both inside and outside of the cage. You like visualize someone doing it. You get it, you get, get them at the right angle. They do the kick and you're like, okay, so you can copy it basically. Exactly. Exactly. It's that ability to copy and see those patterns. Like, let's say we're doing a move on the ground and, yo, that looks exactly the same. If you shift that ground to the cage, now with my back on the cage, the same like my back was on the ground, I can kind of use those same principles, those movements, those patterns to my advantage. So for me, it was just, I don't know, I guess constantly analyzing the game and the sports and the mental aspect too. But just, I, I was all in, like, like I said before in the beginning, I was just really interested in fighting 
just being interested in it. And, and then that kind of led to me being a fighter and that led to me really being about it. But it, it was just an extreme like intellectual curiosity first. So I think that that being almost like one of my special interests, I guess, was a huge advantage for me because I was just thinking about it constantly and analyzing so everything like, constantly. So you like learn, learned about it before you got involved in the, the practical oh, yeah. sort of aspect to it. You sort of watch fights, you watch videos on how to do certain kicks and you know, how to, which style to adopt for what height or weight that you like. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly. That's the stuff that I watch. <laughs> yeah, and it was kind of taboo, honestly, like learning online in the very beginning when I started. And then now, like, of course, everyone's coaching. They have their online classes and stuff. But, you know, that was like in the early stages of YouTube and everything too. So it, it was weird, like some school, especially jujitsu, which is like a lot of guys would be like, old school ways like you can only learn from me things like that and that's changing now but it it was kind of taboo to, to learn from these other places but i would just be secretly online like learning all these new techniques or trying to and things like that so i think that aspect of my brain like that fixation on on learning i think that definitely was an advantage because you know it allowed me to to rise up to the rankings pretty quickly so i turned pro when i was 27 and I got into the UFC when I was 30 and that's a pretty quick turnaround for especially someone who turned pro really late in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And I fully attribute that to, to kind of, you know, being autistic and just being all the way in. It's, very, it's really weird. Where did you say that sort of very quick sort of rise up in skill level? Cause mm -hmm. um, most of the people that I used to fight, they'd been training in Taekwondo since we were like six or eight or like, like the whole life basically. I started when I was 14 um, at very, very, very traditional Taekwondo place for a couple of years when I was 16, moved to a competitive sort of the sports side of it that you see on the Olympics and stuff like that. And um, now I got, I got quite far in quite very, very few years, actually, sort of looking back on it. Um, yeah, I think it could it's be a lot of that same thing. Yeah. That pattern recognition, that ability to just dial in, I guess. Well, I mean, what do you think? Don't know. I used to perform really badly in like my own country with people that I knew, like because I I always used to sort of try to, you know, I I want to dominate them because they're they're my country and I'm the champion. I'm going to dominate them, um, just so that they. You know, when I see them about or something, they give me some kind of weird respects. I don't know. But <laughs> but when I went abroad, like fighting people that I didn't know, um, I actually did really, really well. I, I did. I went to the under 21 European Championships in Romania. And, um, you know, the, at, at the time they weren't so high up, but there's, there's people in there who are like gold medalists now in the Olympics, um, silver medalists, you know, top tier sort of Taekwondo athletes that, uh, we all went over and we fought in our individual weight classes. And, um, I did the best out of everybody and I lost mm -hmm. to the eventual, the eventual Russian winner. Now, I think that was, that was probably my, you know, looking back, considering where they are now, you know, uh, it's probably my, a bigger highlight than I thought it'd be like, just cause I didn't get a medal. Like I still won like three fights against the world's top you know, tier, Europe's top top tier. Yeah, um, yeah, it's amazing. I I I am wanting to to try out going back into it, but as you know, I am currently recovering from an ACL operation. Mm. Uh, I got it done last, not last Wednesday. Yeah, the Wednesday before last. Um, so it's been nearly two weeks it's been it's been awful um but i'm actually surprised that i've been able to, to sit this chair for so long um it's definitely very painful i had my my acl reconstructed my mcl reconstructed and cartilage removed and they how they do it is they sort of take take like one of your hamstrings and like basically feed off about a length a length of tendon from your hamstring and then like Drill a hole in the top bone, hole in the bottom. Oof. Feed it through. 
<laughs> Oof. Yeah, that does not sound good. I've heard of some, sometimes it like doesn't take or something. Is everything going okay in your process so far? It's actually been pretty, pretty, pretty well, to be honest. I mean, I can nice. get full ex- full extension now. Like the physio is the worst part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can bend past 90 degrees now, which, you know, th- those are the main markers because you don't want to have like impingements, team movements or anything like that. But I'm on very heavy doses of tramadol at the moment. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, I could imagine that was a lot of stuff they had to do to clean up that knee and, and get it right. Yeah. I had my stitches removed recently and that really helps, but it's um it's a work in progress. I think maybe I might be able to return to proper training in probably about nine months. So it's a while but I can sort of you know gotta build my flexibility up and and all that, but Yeah. And how how so, would you deal with the um Obviously, you wouldn't be trying to compete at that high level. I think a hard thing for me going through this process of being retired now and what's something I would assume you would face uh, as you go back into it is how do you find that right balance, right, of of training mm-hmm. for the fun and being slightly competitive but not letting yourself get lost to that identity of being this this high-level competitor type of thing. I think that's that's been difficult mm-hmm. for me. If I, if I had the lo- my location right, like I have the gym quite close by, then I, I'd be able to train two to three hours every day and it not sort of impact other areas of my life. Cause I, I tend to be very, very busy all the time <laughs> with various different things. And, but to, I, it's always been, re- you know, just having the cardio and the, you know, any, any type of fitness, like it just does something to your brain. Like you feel karma, you feel a bit more, you feel a bit more like yourself, a bit more present, quite a bit more focused and, like when you when you go for a hard session and you sort of push yourself to past where you think you could have could have pushed yourself to, you feel good about that and you're like, why can't I do that in other areas of my life? I think the fight the fighter men- that sort of stoic fighter mentality is really underrated. Like and it's, I suppose sort of leading on to our last question, it's kind of related to this, but you know, we we obviously have a big problem of uh bullying for for autistic people. It happens at a much larger rate, a lot of isolation, a lot of mental health that's be developed during, particularly during secondary school or high school. And um, I guess, how do you, how do you think learning martial arts can help, you know, these people that, that are finding themselves in these situations other than that sort of stoic mentality that can kind of help you get through other areas yeah, of absolutely. life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it, it can help so much. Um, I think being able to to learn martial arts, being able to go in and train, you learn more about yourself in terms of what you can handle. You learn that you can face adversity day in and day out. You learn that you can grow. You can start to add more of these techniques and things to your arsenal. Um, and you also obviously learn that you could be physically safe. Mm-hmm. And I think by by kind of combining all of those into one aspect, martial arts is is a really good tool for for people to obviously stop the bullying in a, in a physical way but just being more confident and oftentimes it takes really just that that aura of confidence whether you have it or not it's the appearance of it can shake a bully off um mm-hmm. and i think that martial arts gives you those tools and I, i've seen it most of the gyms i've been a part of have had like anti-bullying programs for kids and whatnot and so good yeah, it, it's great. And it is really cool to see these kids in there and grinding away and, and you see them, you know, being forced in these social interactions and, and, and being learned how to or learning how to control their bodies and everything. But it just it develops so much confidence as someone who's an adult who got into martial arts rather than doing it from when I was really little and, and building my way up. It um, it for sure helped me so much develop that more of that confidence. And I'm not here saying that that I'm super confident. Like clearly I have my issues and had my issues and and was was wondering all these weird social things this whole time, but I'm much, much better off than when I was before I stepped into the gym. So yeah, it's, it's a great vehicle for developing. I I feel like people really, really get wrong. What confidence is about. Like when people think of, think of confidence, they think of like, 
oh, I've got to act like Conor McGregor everywhere. Like I've got to be, I've got to be the aggressive, domineering person that kind of walks in and you know, if anyone says anything to you, you tell them what's what, and if not, you beat them up. Or people think that's confidence, but like confidence is just the ability to be unre- non-reactive to what people do. Like someone threatens you, you're like, I know how to fight pretty well. Like. You're coming. It's like they're the challenger. And you're like coming to you rather than eat sort of equal playing field or above. Like you may see them as you know before you train trained in martial arts or combat or you know things like that. And I think that the best way to build that confidence is through competence. So like how good you are at something. Having a lot of confidence about around fighting and not being very good at fighting is just like what do you call it? Um, arrogance. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely. It's, it's more the like Commonwealth Greg stuff, it's more being arrogant than anything. Like, if you want to see someone who's like confident, you know, a really great example would be like Vladimir Klitschko or like butchered his last name, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, that sort of that calmness, that non reactivity, that sort of that's, um, it can, it can do a lot. Of, lot for people because they kind of expect you to react when they do something to antagonize you and if you don't and you kind of just don't really sort of lower yourself to their to their level it, it i mean it doesn't always work but it does work in my, in most situations in my life it has like uh, avoiding fights has been the best thing about fighting yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely it is. There's that famous uh, Bruce Lee movie, right, where someone's challenging him on the boat to a scrap. And he's like, okay, let's take this little boat off their main ship and let's go to that island and we'll fight. The guy gets in the boat and he just, he kicks it off. And then he, he lets the guy kind of just float away. And it is that ability to stay calm and kind of avoid the fight, just be assured, self-assured and and I think that that's the real type of confidence that martial arts is trying to instill to be, be able to keep calm under pressure. And that's an important thing. And then obviously have those tools to, as you said, not be arrogant with it, to, to know actually how to defend yourself, but, but to be calm in, in all those situations is just really important. I really like that, that Bruce Lee analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, especially when you're a kid and you're, you're surrounded in this complex environment, you may not even know you're autistic. You may not, you may know, but not really understand it or understand the people around you. And for, I mean, it, just in general, like having some routine to exercise, it just helps. You know, it helps <laughs> with your confidence. Like people, like parents are so apprehensive about letting the kids do martial arts. Like, like the coaches, they're going to throw them in with the adults and full contacts like Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, you know it's it's not like that and i'm you know even even at my size six three i've sparred with eight-year-olds before um didn't really stand a chance but (laughs) 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 But, uh, we just just had fun with it and stuff and it it, i think it does really depend on the gym sometimes you can get some bad gyms out there but most of them that i've seen you know really great places to kind of build human who's confident in themselves competent you know has some structure to their lives Mm -hmm. that kind of thing i mean there's there's nothing wrong with that yeah no and and like we talked about before facing that that daily struggle and then learning to overcome it um either by winning winning your match learning new moves whatever it is or by losing your match losing the sparring match and then coming back the next day to do it all over again you know, it's about facing that struggle and, you know, you just keep coming back. You just keep coming back and, and soon you'll learn that you can overcome these obstacles. Um, one of my favorites is so Marcus Aurelius and, and Ryan Holiday wrote a, a popular modern book on it. It's called The Obstacle is the Way. And I think that martial arts is, is a great teacher for that because life will throw so much at you and some of it's going to be in our control and, and a lot of it won't be. But we just got to kind of bear that and, and just keep going at times, you know. So that's, um, you know, martial arts is a great tool for that. Well, I think that's 
all of the questions that I had to ask you. Um, I have like a little segment because it's, it's season two of my podcast and I'm trying to like spruce it up a little bit. So um, we've been doing this thing called Song of the Day. So do you have a particular song in mind that, you know, perhaps when you were training or you were just about to go into a fight that you would always put on? Song of the Day. I um, I know we were talking a little bit about this before. Uh, Kendrick Lamar is my guy. You know, I started fighting in, when I was in LA, so he he's my guy. He just came out with a new album, and there's a song called The Heart Part 5. And that one is more about perspective and life experiences. And, and for me, that that's really important to me. And um, yeah, it, it just resonated so much. So it's either that song, or if I'm actually walking into a fight, it would be Mad City by him, by one of his uh, his older albums. But yeah, Kendrick's, Kendrick's my guy, and, and that song always gets me fired uh, up. It, it's one of my walkout songs, so it's a, it's a classic for me. <laughs> nice, nice. I'll add them both on. Cause the the playlist trying to trying to build like a Spotify playlist and like mm-hmm. put everyone's songs of the day on. Cause I I would really love to like play like background music like throughout the podcast, um, but it's just not feasible. Sort of and maybe if I was like an organization or a company or like the BBC or something, then I might be able to. But just me on my own, it's not really feasible. Yeah, moment. and those copyright content guys will will strike it down for that one. <laughs> I feel you on that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And yes, I well, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Of course, you can find the Forty Forty podcast um, anywhere: Spotify, Apple Apple Music, Google Google Podcasts, blah. And um, if you want to follow the other stuff, the other work that I do, maybe see the video version of this interview. If you feel like it, I would really appreciate a rating uh, because I have not been asking for ratings for a long, long time or throughout the first season. So uh, if you can, give me a nice, uh, you know, few stars, preferably five. That would be great. Do you have any links or, or anything that you'd like to to share with the yeah, world? Yeah, Absolutely. I'm uh, I'm currently uh, running a little project. One of my uh, later interests now has been Web3. So you can check that out at mixedmartialautist.com where I'm trying to help share my story and use that where all the sales of the story, um, it's all benefiting uh, the Autism Society of Hawaii, which is a nonprofit organization, um, obviously awesome. back home where I'm from in Hawaii. Uh, but it's going to be a fun, uh, kind of unique art project where it's part autobiography, uh, part me talking about fighting and everything and, and looking back on my life now with this newly discovered lens of, you know, actually being autistic. And um, hooray. Other than that, you can find me. Yeah. Yeah. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, obviously, at, at Vince the Anomaly and my website, Vince the Cool. Well, um, have you have you enjoyed your 40 40 experience? Oh, I loved it, man. Yeah, thank you so much for for having me on. I really appreciate it and uh, giving me like a little platform to share what I'm about. You know, obviously this whole thing has been new for me and it's been a fun adventure kind of seeing everyone's different perspectives and, and just the diversity within this neurodiverse crowd is, it's kind of insane how, how wide that, that spectrum is, how in so many different directions it is. So it's really cool to to kind of understand and feel like I actually kind of fit in for once too is, is great. So thank you, man. I appreciate it. Awesome stuff. It's been absolutely amazing talking to you. And uh, I was going to say fangirling, but fangirling all about <laughs> MMA, combat sports. It's, it's not often that I get to talk about it being out of the, well, you know, once you're in the fight game, it's all that you talk about. Once you're out, there's no one to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, Hope you guys have enjoyed this episode and for me and Vince, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. See you later, folks. Thank you, guys.